My name is Vernon Walden. I was born in Greenville, South Carolina, 2-25-27. I came up shortly during the Depression, or at the end of the Depression, which you're too young to know about. But anyway, there was little work and little money and things of that nature. And I'm the baby of 10 children, so we, we could put away a lot of food. Anyway, mom and dad was textile workers in, in the factories. I went to grammar school, Welcome Grammar School, then Welcome High School. It's since changed its name, but that's not important. But it was Welcome High School Warriors. We had the Indian sign, Warriors, you know, so. It was a patriotic thing for young boys to lie about their age and go in service. Many guys in my high school lied about their age, and maybe some of the 11th graders were old enough, I don't know. But we only had 11th grades in, now they have 12. So I lied about my age and got my mom to forge me a birth certificate, you know, and, and he turned me down on my eye, and he took about four of us back to retest. I had bought a bracelet, but I couldn't afford my name on it yet. Ten cents a letter, I didn't have any change, any money. So the sergeant said, young man or whatever you call me, that's a good looking bracelet you got there. I said, well, if I pass that test, it's yours. I passed the test. And they had kids there that was colorblind. I never heard of colorblind. They could look at red and couldn't tell if it was green, yellow, or pink. That blew my mind, you know, for somebody not to be able to detect color. You need that to push a button or open the door or whatever, you know. But anyway, I went in service and and there were several underage in service when I was there. They didn't check you too close. So I immediately was after training shipped overseas. Stayed with the same unit five years. So I knew everybody and worked my way up to sergeant. And of course, we went to Korea. They rotated us by alphabet. They started about nine months after the war started. It started rotating you, but you had to have a replacement. You had nothing to do with the replacement coming. So I'm W. I'm on the tail end of the alphabet, you know. So I was there nine, three months at least, every week we'd rotate two or three guys, you know, whatever came in. So the day I was supposed to go home, the company moved out on a company operation. I had no place to stay. I said, you get careless and foolish and reckless. I said, what the hell's one more? I've been on many. I went on that last patrol and got wounded. Spent a month in a hospital in South Korea then I rotated home, and about three months later, I was discharged. I stayed out 85 days, and I missed the Army, so I re-enlisted and stayed in for 25 years. Now, wow. made master sergeant, you know, and could have went to officer's candidate school, but I was hesitant and too hard-headed and high-tempered or whatever. I said, Colonel, thanks. My colonel was wounded interviewed you and he, he's the one that asked me to go to OCS. I said, thanks, Colonel, but no. So I stayed a sergeant all my life. <laughs> Which branch of the military did you serve in? The infantry. 25 years infantry. That's the ground pounders, they call us, you know. What made you want to enlist? Well, the war had just ended, but before I started to get in, the war was still going on. But time World I, War II. World War II. So time I was turned down two or three times by the Navy and Marines, Merchant Marines and all, I got back, lied about, I learned a little bit more what questions to answer and how to answer them. So I enlisted underage and many of us went to Korea underage. So, how old were you when you enlisted? 16. And had you graduated uh, high school at that point? 
No, I graduated high school in service. I smart enough, I finished my high school in service. That made me eligible to apply for officers, OCS, officers candidate school. But I decided at that point, no, I was always in trouble and, and whatever, and I said, I, I don't want to be an officer. Not real trouble, but you know, I was small and they picked on me. They didn't pick on me the second time, so I could take care of myself and, and get got along with them once they found out they don't bully this little rebel. <laughs> Your initial training days, what were they like? The training days? Before the war, we drilled every day with, a, I did a heavy weapons company. Every regiment has three heavy weapon companies. I was in heavy, I'd already been in light weapons. After a year or two, you, I want to go to heavy weapons company and learn those weapons. It's step up. So I was in a heavy weapons company and we'd just drill every day on, on the parade field, breaking down the gun and setting it up and it's a three-man gun, the mortar that I was in, so it's, it comes in three pieces, and each piece weighs 40-some pounds. So it takes three men to carry it. So we just drill and drill, and it got monotonous, so you would change with somebody in a machine gun platoon, you know. They'd get with the sergeants and just change, and they learned the heavy weapons. They already knew the light weapons. So when we went to Korea, we had a few men, but we were well trained. One guy gets knocked down, you could pick up his place or his gun or whatever and, and take care of it. So you come very close in combat, you know, and all the good training that you've had comes out of you. And that's what pays off the, where you come back or not many times, you know, so. What was the date that you enlisted? 29 April 1946 and for two years I I played big time football in the army I was small but I know football I should have been a maybe a coach I know football I was the smallest man in the division and I made first string I played many games 60 minutes with them big boys believe me we had some college boys high school all Americans and I played two years in the third year, we were going to win everything, but of course the war broke out and I didn't get to play any more football. Oh, I did go to Fort Benning and I went out for the team there. They had, they had oh man, so many big guys and ex more experience. Didn't have more experience. I just didn't get recognized. I played in high school, you know. But uh, I had applied for airborne training. And I saw I wasn't going to make this team. Those boys are too big, too fast, and too good, you know. And my size was against me. Not what I knew and didn't know, but my size. So my application come back and I had a choice, go airborne or, or play football. I knew I wouldn't make that team. It was too big for me and too many guys. So I went to airborne school and became a paratrooper for the next 13 or 14 years. And later on went to Special Forces, which all Special Forces people must be airborne qualified. I don't care if he's a cook, a driver, or a clerk. If he don't jump out of an airplane, we don't want him. So when you see somebody with Special Forces, he's automatically airborne. So I was in the 82nd Airborne, and they said, we're one over in your, your job title. Well, good. I went across the street and applied for Special Forces and made three trips to Nam. <laughs> I, w I started skydiving, free falling. I had to buy my gear and all, you know. I said, them guys are getting $55 a month. What the hell's wrong with you, Vern? So, I went to airborne school and started getting that fit. And all the instructors in my free fall were paratroopers, of course. So we hit it off real well, you know. I did my part and then some, you know, working 
at the clubhouse and helping pack shoots and all like that. So I got some, some nice trips. Wyoming, all over North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and other places, you know, they would ask for us on a holiday or something, go up and jump for them. Armed Forces Day, I met one of our World War II heroes. He was an officer in the reserves. We went to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and had a reserve officers meeting that night. So we had our uniforms on and went up and said, Audie, Audie Murphy. We said, can we speak to Audie? Sure, come in. No, we just want to shake his hand. We don't want to get in there with them officers, you know. So we got to say hello to Audie in a couple of years, not a couple of years later, three or four months, he was going to Virginia and crashed and died in an airplane crash. But we got to meet him, you know, and I've, I've read his life's history 10 times, and he's no Texas boy, you know. He had medals. The shirt didn't have room for all of his medals, you know. Where were you when the Korean War started? Oh, I was in southern Japan. The closest unit to Korea was the 19th Infantry. Our sister regiment, 100 and 50 miles away, and I'm guessing, because we played each other in football and all that. My unit was 700 miles away from our base camp. Starting the next Monday, the Marines was going to teach us amphibious, amphibious warfare, how to waterproof our jeeps, the carburetor and fuel pump, and I'll keep it from getting water. Well, Sunday night, the commander come told me, Sergeant Wallen, I'm going to take the troops by train. It took 24 hours to go 700 miles. You bring all the trucks and jeeps and, oh, took me three days. You know, train took three days. So I arrived at five, uh, six o'clock in the morning. At, they had all the vehicles backed up, ready to go in the LST. LST, the whole front goes down and you back the vehicles in. Landing ship tanks is what LST stands for. It goes up and the tanks drive right out in the water and go ashore. So the commander said, my nickname, Jody. Jody, show him how to back this trailer in. Of course, it was double loaded. The three quarters were double loaded. Old wire steering wheel and the tires are this big. No power steering was ever, you know. The good Lord was with me. With me. Three days on that trip, I had been drinking Japanese beer. I traded my food for beer. I got in there and backed that thing right up the first time. Lieutenant said, rest of you, do it like Jody. I said, thank you, Lord, and I, I hid. I couldn't have done another one. So about an hour later, we sailed, or Korea. At 5 o'clock that same day, we landed in Tucson. What date was this? 5 July, I landed in Korea. Two companies from our sister regiment, Two airplanes fools, it was about four companies because they were under strength. They, we were 50% strength at this time, peacetime. Nothing's going to happen. So a lieutenant colonel and two, two airplanes full of men went and was supposed to slow them down. They just blow the bridges and all and move back and blow the next bridge and all to slow them down. So that's what we ran into when I landed five July, and my first firefight was 17 July, so they didn't waste much time getting us up up there, but every river we come to, we had to cross it best we could because all the bridges had been blowed, you know. So there's 200 men from the 21st Infantry, our sister regiment, were the first ones to ground troops. Now, the Air Force had, had already started shooting around Sewell, the capital, you know, because the dividing line from Sewell, the capital of South Korea, is just about 
50 miles from the north and south border. So the airplanes come over, no resistance, they just bum Sewell and kill a lot of our people and whatever. About a month later, our aircraft had shot all their 300 airplanes down and they didn't have any more. But they come 10,000 man armies coming. And I killed many of them that had pot, dope or whatever you want to call it, you know. And they get high and they're ready to go, you know, and that's good. That's, they're not good soldiers, but they do stupid things, you know. And some of them stupid things, you know, we're not prepared for, so. This was on the American side or the North Korean side that was smoking pot? The North Korean guys. If our, our guys didn't have time, we didn't have time to, I, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. So I don't know anything about it. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I had the opportunity. No, thank you. I wanted to be an all-American football player. And that was the difference, probably where I smoked or not. I could run all day and never get tired, honey. So I was in good shape or I wouldn't be here today. So our Navy controlled the seas after about the first month it took them, you know, to get out from Hawaii and all around. So they had no more aircraft. We didn't have to worry about any aircraft. The U U.S. Air Force, whatever, we don't know the story, but they had 10, South Korean pilots had 10 P-51s. That's the fast aircraft and it has two or three guns in each wing and it's fast. We were pushing back, and when they pushed us back, we didn't, we're not going to dig any foxholes or anything, because next day we're going to move back a little further, you know, when they started pushing us back. This was August the 12th, so see the war had only been going on since 5 August for me, 5 July. So here, here come two P-51s. We're on the side of the hill. My gun is there, my three rounds or four whatever I had was there, and they never hit it, but I saw them kick up dirt all around it, you know. The guns are about this far apart. A little liaison plane, two-seater, they were called bird dogs, they guide the aircraft. And he's there like this, and they come right under him the second time and shot our area. Then I guess by that time, the pilots realized we had still had guys with white shirts, you know, waving them off and waving them off. There was no, there was water trenches there. Monsoon season, it rained 60, 70 days nonstop. So there was water trenches and we jumped in them. But that bullet would have got us. But luckily, we only had one guy that got shot across the wrist. Of course, there wasn't many of us there. So if I said three got wounded, that was... 30% of what we had there. See. But they didn't hit my gun, and they didn't bother my six or five rounds, whatever I had. And they left. And of course, we have no communication with the Air Force. We don't know if it was South Korean pilots, because it was P-51s, it was American planes. So I don't know if they, if they left Japan, they'd leave Japan with a target. And it's just a few minutes across there, and sometimes that target can move up or down. We never knew what happened. But my mail clerk, he got right across the wrist, and he, old West Virginia boy, he was scared of snakes. I said, he said, if they come back, I'm going to get in that hole. I said, there's a snake in there. He said, I'm going to get in there with him. If you've ever been shot, a snake ain't nothing, snake bite. But anyway, that was a little humor uh, in combat, you tell jokes and, and and make fun of each other, and it helps. It relaxes you, you know. So that was a more or less point of it, you know, because I knew he was scared of snakes, you know. So anyway, there's times that you you have fun, and well, when they really come over the top of the hill and and you start picking them off like flies, that's a lot of fun, you know. So you got them going on your side, you know. So. Anyway, I lost a lot of good friends. On that paper I filled out, it said, name your friends. Well, I just put one. 
His nickname was Lucky. Craig, I can't think of his first name at this minute. We were together four and a half years. His nickname was Lucky and he played football. And we we're 30 or 40 yards to the road in the creek. He drank a lot of water. He said, Jody, let's go get some water. There's nobody to stay with this gun. I'm going to stay with this gun. I don't drink much water. So he went down. I could throw a rock how far the water was. He got captured. There's a little checkpoint there, like a police station or something, no wooden building, you know, and had a blackboard in it. They, we pushed him back, and I went through that building and said, Lucky was here. He said he knew I would see it. And they took him, when he started in North Korea with him, the train stopped and to pick some more prisoners up, and he was a g great swimmer. He went in the front door, and, you know, you go to the back and load the front. Back door was open, and the river's right there. Their river's not big, but they have a lot, a lot of creeks. You know. He hit the river and came, came to safety. And I put in my report there. I met him a year later in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I was on my way to Fort Riley. I stopped and met him. And I, it, this was about a, oh, when he got captured right away. So it's about a year later. We met and had a couple of beers, and I had to go into Camp Fort Riley, and he was stationed at Leonardwood. So for that whole year, you didn't know what had happened to him? I, I knew I knew he made it home, because he come out in the paper, Lucky Craig, 19th Infantry, so all his girlfriends and whatever wrote to him, he said, write to Vern Wallen. So I got the letter, and I said, Last time I saw your son, he was okay, but we got separated. We went to different units, and they don't know what different unit means and all that, and I don't want to tell them because we had to show our letters to an officer for him to seal it. I'd start showing my letters to him. Well, let get the hell out of here, you know. I, he knew I wouldn't write nothing heroic or baloney or whatever, you know. So, no, no. But I just told him, last time I saw him, he was okay. Left it at that. One girl asked me about her brother. She said, I'm 18 years old from Georgia, and I live in South Carolina. Vern, when you come through, stop by. I'm not a bad-looking girl. Woo! I was already engaged, so I didn't stop by. So two weeks after I got home, I got married, you know, and we'd been writing for five years, so... Nothing was going to change that, as long as I was able-bodied, you know, so. What unit were you in? D Company, Delta, D, Delta Company, 19th Infantry Regiment, 24th Infantry Division. We were in southern Japan there, you know, and... So what was it like? You were one of the very first troops to come to Korea at the beginning of the war. What was that like at the very beginning? Well, we had little information. You know, it wasn't time for, I don't know what happened to our intelligence. Quickly, after I studied, and I've given classes at the university and, and high schools, we had two infantry divisions in South Korea. Now, they were probably 50% strength like we was, but they were there with all their equipment on. So, oh, Russia sitting back. They de deactivated these two divisions, done away with them. And they sent those few people to Japan. We got 15 or 20 of them, 25th Infantry. Every unit got a few replacements. So Russia sitting back there says, damn, there's no troops there to protect that field. And I've never saw or heard anything to the contrary, you know. I just said that to myself. I was there in Japan four years before I went to Korea, so they just come with no resistance. So 10,000-man armies, and they had about 300 aircraft, but 
about two months later, they didn't have one. Six or seven months later, at night, of course, we had no fires, no lights, no nothing. Here come this little one or two man aircraft, little putt putt, we call it. Putt, sound like a washing machine. And everything's dark here, you know. I could see him, but it's at night, you don't know. So we made sure we had no rounds that, that showed red, you know, tracer rounds. We'd have a magazine, we just all black. And I'd shoot at him. I don't know if I ever got any rounds in him or not, but he come over two or three nights, and that's the only airplane they had left. You know, but 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 that's he. I don't know when he went back. He'd go down a little ways and go around. He couldn't carry much, whatever. But he had no lights on. You know, of course he's up there by himself. But he's not going to hit anything but the mountainside or something. You know, so I don't never never know what happened to it. Of course, so. We was up near the North Korea at that time, so he didn't have far to come. To he never dropped any. Well, it was all dark. Why drop your ammunition if you had a few rounds? If you can't see something, so we made sure we we were blacked out, you know. But I could see him go over, and I'd fire on him. Don't ever know what happened to him. Wish I did know. <laughs> I'd like to tell him I'm the one that shot you down, you so and so, you know. But I'll never know what happened to it. So can you kind of tell me an overview, uh, like, where where all did you go during your time in Korea? What what battles did you participate in or campaigns? They were about five. I don't recall the names and all, you know. But when we got a lot of troops now, we would push them. It'd be Operation Smith, we'd say. And then after we pushed them too far, we didn't. We were strung out, you know, so they'd push us back. So I went up and down the island a couple of times, you know. That island's just 150 miles wide, and and that's at the widest point, and about 200 yards long, 200 miles long. So it's a very small southern Korea is a very small part of it, you know. But it's you're either going uphill or downhill. There's a road going up to east side and the west side, and the train goes up and comes down. Between every third big mountain, there's a road that connects east and west. So traffic is gets jammed up, believe me, well, when the military was there. All the roads was dirt, very narrow. You couldn't get over to the side, it'd cave off with you, you know. And, uh, we had many obstacles, many hazardous things to, that we did when trying to fight the war, you know. We didn't have enough food. We didn't have a back supply of ammunition. I'd fire a few rounds. Supply sergeant would maybe come up with a hot soup or something, you know. And sergeant went back and get some more ammunition. When a plane comes in from Japan, that's that's the only answer, but it's not a good answer. When another plane comes in, he may have ammunition, he may have food or whatever you know so we we were fighting but we had to restrict our ammunition we couldn't shoot just to scare hell out of them or, or shoot them to see if they moving or anything no we didn't have enough ammunition so we had to we 50 percent strength 50 percent ammunition and all and you're fighting a big war we we were caught with our pants down it's just that simple. I had this gentleman on TV the other day ask me, why did they call it the Forgotten War? Well, they come across without warning. There was no build-up. We didn't expect anything like if we was going to fight China or some big nation. You know. So here they come at, at their surprise time and call us with few troops, and they just beat the hell out of us for a a year, you know. So I, I fought the whole year with limited ammunition. When they could, they could get, get a hot meal up to you. That didn't happen too often, you know. They give us sea rations. It turned cold. Their, their winters it gets 40 below, and the wind is 
40 miles an hour. We were, I don't know what happened, we were seven miles from China. And at this time we were riding our, our trucks in, but we'd put sea ration on the motor. And time you took the lid off, it was frozen. 40 below, it don't take it but 30 seconds. You know, as the trucks went along and the tanks and all, we'd put a can of beans or something on there. Time you opened it, it was frozen. So they said, turn around and go back. We were seven miles from China. General MacArthur wanted to go into China and the president relieved him, if you might remember reading it. So we turned around, we had not we, the U.S., we had tanks, 90-ton Sherman tanks. They might go five miles and run out of gas. they pull them over on the side of the road and put a thermite grenade down the tube. And that, it gets 1,000 degrees. So that just immediately tears up all the working gear for the guns and the motor, you know. A truck, run out of gas, push it over on the side road, throw a grenade in it, and start walking until you can catch something else, you know. So you were blowing up your own vehicles? We were blowing up our own vehicles, keep the them. enemy from getting them because we had no gasoline to, to make them go. And we had to witness all that and dream about it and whatever, you know. Ninety thousand nine ninety ton Sherman tanks cost ninety thousand dollars, you know, or, or more. And I saw him just a thermite gun that gets a thousand degrees. You put it down a tube. You're not going to ever fire that weapon again. It just eats, melts everything. So, and then we'd catch the next thing that was moving. We'd start walking at least. You, but it was forty degrees below zero, and. You don't feel nothing, you're just a mummy. You just you just know you're moving slowly, you know. Starting the winter, it snowed this deep. We had no sunglasses. Everybody got snow blind. If I can't describe snow blind to you except everything looks the same. You can't see a ditch, you can't see a log across the street. You're just a mummy walking. A few days later, a week later, they got some sunglasses in from Tokyo or China somewhere. But we had guys that was colorblind just stumbling and falling and not knowing. They'd get up and fall again. What the hell did I stumble over, you know? You could, everything looks the same. It's a terrible feeling, you know. And it's hard to explain. Because I don't know the scientific name for all that being snow blind and Everything looking the same, but we had to retreat with stumbling and falling and trying to catch a ride and destroying everything that run out of gas. It was a terrible thing to to be from such a powerful country and be treated like the way we were treated, you know. Totally unprepared. Totally unprepared. We had some good troops, thank God, they were well trained, you know. They could handle any gun, and that saved a lot of people. Usually you you in the mortars, you don't know the machine gun or anything, but in peacetime we had time to switch and train, and uh, you do the same thing every day, it gets old, so you change with a machine gun partner, and you, you cross train, and saved a lot of our troops. They were good soldiers, young, right out of high school, or like me, went in a little early and had to get, when I first got back, I took the test from my high school, see what I needed to study. He said, hell, you're ready for the test. I said, well, whip it on me. I took my test and got my GED, you know. And you never know, like say, the officer wanted me to, my colonel wanted me to go to OCS, I said no. Being an old country boy and coming up 
poor and whatever. I said, no, I don't want to be a second lieutenant. <laughs> I'm here. I don't know what it'd have been if I'd have took the commission and whatever. You don't, you don't know. You don't look back. You don't worry. You just move forward. So I went to Korea, uh, Vietnam three times, special forces. You're out in the jungle with six, eight men, you know, and I went three times, and the last time, I'd been there a year, and I got a letter from my daughter, the one that sold my clothes. She went to Burgess, never made below an A. If she'd ever made a B, she'd had a heart attack. She went to UTEP four years, and never made it under an A. She'd have made B, she'd had a heart attack. Her sister, nurse, come along. If she'd have ever made 100, she'd have had a heart attack. She'd get 70 and quit. Carol, Dad, I passed. What do you want? Was her, my attitude. I made enough to play football. I, I failed a couple of subjects I could have passed if I hadn't been hard headed. Country boy, whatever. I'm not blaming it on the country boy because I lived between the city and the country. I was neither. So I learned a little bit from the farmers I went to high school with, and I didn't learn anything from the city because they were better than we were. They knew we were outside the city, so we were looked down upon. Except when it comes to volleyball and softball, now we beat the hell out of it. So uh, how long were you in Japan before the Korean War started? How long? Four years. So that was the rebuilding process in Japan that you were a part of? Yes. Yeah, I finished my training and I come out on orders with. Sorry. Oh, I come out on orders for all of us was going to Korea. I thought I knew my history and geography as good as anybody. I, I loved the subject, so I studied them. I went over to the Signal Library and got a film. Gee whiz, what a backwards country, you know. What was the date that you departed from Korea? I would have to say around, I'm guessing 20 August, I left the hospital, you know, and I had no, no identification, no nothing. But I was there a month. I was wounded the year when I had a year there. So I went to the hospital and probably Two weeks, I was out of there. So I'm August 20 is a good guess. Of 51? 51. And when did you arrive back in the U.S.? Well, I had to ride the ship, so it took a couple of weeks. I was in Japan about a week, so August, probably September the 5th, I landed in the States. Yes, because I wanted to get married the first weekend, and... My girlfriend was a little sick, and her, her girlfriend told me, we got to postpone it a week. She she was like me, so bashful, wouldn't say anything. Her girlfriend was a year old or something. She burned, she's sick, put it off a week. Okay, so so I was home about two weeks and got married. and Got two wonderful daughters, and one's a retired nurse, but, and the other one's a, she's still some kind of educator in the Socor district. She goes to the high schools and puts out all the fires. And I've heard some guys that she counseled, and they said, you don't ever want to be counseled a second time by Ms. Wallen. She's little, but she's loud. And they, they worship the ground she walks on. She took a whole group to Europe. We was in Germany two years. During that two years, she reads, speaks, and writes German. So. She took a group to Germany and Italy and all from the high school, you know. And another group left Valentine, Texas. That's out from Van Horn. If you and I saw it in the paper, and I sent him a hundred dollars, and I said, "My daughter took a trip there. I know where you're going, and I'm special forces retired and all." Got the nicest letter back, and from a high school kid, it was perfect. I thought, boy, this kid has got 
good handwriting on it. I showed it to my daughter. I said, I sent them $100. And they put in a paper they needed donation, you know. So I sent them $100. And they said, thank you for your service. And the, right, the wording and everything was just right. I don't know if he had help, but he sure wrote a nice letter. And I, I've had to write many letters being in the service, you know, to, for different things. So, And I used to be pretty good at it. Now I can't even read my own writing sometimes. <laughs> what do you think of the legacy of the Korean War and the Korean War veterans? Well, if you ask 10 of us, you'd probably get eight answers be the same, you know. We were put in a bad situation, and you really get buddy-buddy, and you know who to depend on, and you go, and you go, and you go, and they knew I didn't smoke every time we got sea rice and burn, give me your cigarettes and, you know, and you come together because we had to be two people. We had to be two people because we couldn't, couldn't operate. If I just took what I had to take, I'd soon be out of it or whatever. So we'd get extra stuff and, lug it and like my gun was a three-man gun I never had but two men so you're going up and down these rain-soaked hills slipping and sliding with your equipment and you know somebody's gonna pull you through it so 